get on with uh, working it out for various cases. So, um, all right, so I'm going to, let me just give you a quick sketch. Sketch of the course. So, first we're going to do um, what you might call the quick and dirty electromagnetic field. So, using the fact that you already know that the Hamiltonian is equal to this, which is the total energy electromagnetic field that you're familiar with, we can basically just write down, in particular because we know what's coming, we can just write down what the theory looks like, and plus we can calculate um, the interaction with an atom, with an atom in the dipole approximation. We can look at atomic transitions, um, an excited atom decaying, emitting a photon, absorbing a photon. All right, and that's going to be uh, this week and next week. Then we're going to have to backtrack. We're going to do the formal Lagrangian theory of fields. So we will see how to derive the canonical momentum density, the Hamiltonian. So given a field equation, what's its Lagrangian? What's the canonical momentum density? What's the Hamiltonian, etc.? And then we're going to look at the formal quantization, <coughs> formal quantization, canonical commutation relations, etc. So this is going to be, this is really the general formalism, how to set up a quantum field theory. I've got a field equation, Here's the corresponding Lagrangian. I derive the canonical momentum. I derive the Hamiltonian. I can write down the, the quantum field theory. General formalism for QFT. Um, then we're going to apply it to apply it to various cases. So we'll do the real high Gordon field already done it really, but we'll do it more systematically. Then we will do the complex Klein-Gordon field, where you find that you have uh, part in effect particles and antiparticles. A complex field <coughs> describes two kinds of particles with equal and opposite charge. Then we're going to do the Dirac field as we've seen, corresponds to electrons and positrons. And then we're going to do the electromagnetic field again, but in a Lorentz covariant gauge. Um, I should have mentioned here that our quick and dirty electromagnetic field, we're going to do in the Coulomb gauge, which is true only in one reference frame. So the Coulomb gauge says that the divergence of the vector potential is zero. This is true in one Lorentz frame. If you do a Lorentz boost, it will no longer be true. There's nothing wrong with this theory. It is in any given reference frame, it is valid. It gives you the correct answers, the high energies, 
whatever. It's just not the equations are not formally Lorentz covariant. Um, some people like <coughs> to write quantum field theory for the electromagnetic field in a gauge that's explicitly Lorentz covariant, but there's some funny business occurs. You need some bizarre. Um, you have to introduce some unphysical states with negative probability. It's a strange feature of quantum field theory that in order, if you have a gauge field, <coughs> in order to make the theory look explicitly Lorentz covariant, you have to introduce what are in effect unphysical degrees of freedom. In effect, you find you have states in Hilbert space whose norm is negative, which is nonsense. Um, in the early days of quantum field theory, people used to worry about this, thinking there's something wrong with quantum field theory, how the way it relates to relativity. But then people get so used to this, they just see it as part of the formalism, and they invent all kinds of fancy terminology, and they think they're being sophisticated. I still think it's actually just a horrible thing. But anyway, we'll, we'll come to that. So once we've done this, um, with, these are all free fields. We're then going to finally, the final stage, is we're going to look at the interaction. The interaction between the electromagnetic field interacting with the Dirac field. The Dirac field. And we're going to see all of these wonderful processes like pairs of photons turning into an electron and a positron, um, and all those kinds of things. All right, so that is that is the what's coming. And um, so you should have a sense of the physics of, of, of what all this is going to look like. Um, and um, so now we can get on with it. All right, so um, the electromagnetic field. So you should have done courses in electrodynamics <coughs> where you've looked at the electromagnetic field in terms of a vector uh, and a scalar potential. Um, so I'm sure you already know that you can write um, the electric field as minus the gradient of a potential, minus the time derivative of a vector potential, and the magnetic field as the curl of a vector potential. And if we are looking at the free electromagnetic field, um, we can look at it in <coughs> what we call the Coulomb gauge you've probably met, where the divergence of A is zero, and for the free electromagnetic field, so it's free, so there are no charges or currents. No charges or, or currents. <coughs> Maxwell's equation Reduce to just one equation, which is the wave equation for the vector <coughs> potential, with the supplementary condition that the divergence of A is zero. Um, I would have thought you probably know that this already. In case you don't, let me just uh, whiz through. If you want to go through it carefully, you can look in the book. But you know, um, um, you of course remember Maxwell's equations. Um, so in 
space, so I go rho equals j is zero, so the charge density, the charge and the charge density and current density uh, are both equal to zero. So I have the div e is zero. The curl of b is And notice I have, I have units where C is 1. And um, let's see, we've got div B is 0. And the curl of B is minus DB dt. So if you look at these equations, if I, so, well, you know that this, this implies can be written as the curl of A, so this is already satisfied. Um, I take B as the curl of A. Um, let's see. Um, all right, let me write here out the. Um, Curl of E, curl of the gradient of zero. So here I've got the d by dt of the curl of A. So this is already, so that's satisfied. This is already satisfied when I write the electric and magnetic field in this form. So I've got these two equations. If I substitute in these expressions for E and B, what do you get? You get uh, minus del squared phi. So I'm taking the divergence of E. So minus del squared phi minus E by dt of the divergence of A is equal to zero. And the other equation, um, so here I've, I've, I've written this one down. So the curl of B, so the curl of the curl is the, is the gradient of the divergence minus del squared. Um, and if you fiddle around a little bit, you find the following e squared with respect to t squared minus del squared a plus the gradient of d phi dt plus d of a is zero because. Um, Grad div minus del squared, gradient of the divergence of the divergent <coughs> minus del squared, that came from the first term. And then the dE by dt, I get um, the second derivative A with respect to time and this term here. Anyway, you can go through it. Okay, so now remember, we, there are, um, there is an arbitrariness. I can change A and phi by the following transformation. So you should have seen all this before, so it's just a quick reminder. But for some arbitrary function f, I can change A and phi, any, any function f, I can subtract the gradient of f from A, and I simultaneously add the f by dt to phi, you can easily check that the e and b are the same. And we can choose, you can choose, so given any initial a and phi, you can choose, you can find f <coughs> such that <coughs> the divergence of a prime is zero. I can always make the divergence of A prime zero. Why is that? Well, if you look at this equation, it tells you that the divergence of A prime is equal to the divergence of A um, minus del squared F. And if I say I want to set that equal to zero, what I just need to solve 
I take the equation del squared f equals div a. So if I'm given a, so I know the divergence of a, that it's some scalar function. This is just Poisson's equation. I can solve for f in principle. You can solve that for f. And therefore, with that f, your a prime will have zero divergence. Okay, so you can always find the gauge transformation to make the divergence zero. And when the divergence is zero, this term goes away, and this term goes away. And if I have, um, let's look at this equation. If I have del squared phi is zero everywhere, and if I require phi to be zero at infinity, then the solution is phi is zero. Okay, so I've got our phi is zero, <coughs> and if I have phi is zero, then this term goes away, and this equation becomes indeed uh, as advertised, just this, and I've done it right. Okay. All right, anyway. So Maxwell's equations, uh, I can always um, write it for free electromagnetic field, I can write in the Coulomb gauge where there, there's no scalar potential, the divergence of the vector potential is zero, and all of Maxwell's equations reduce to these two equations, the wave equation for A and the gauge condition that the div of A is zero. Okay, so now what happens is we remember the way modern field theory works is that in the Heisenberg picture for the operator fields, you're going to get the same equations. Um, and what we do is we use our understanding of these equations to write the field in terms of plane wave states that when the field is quantized, it's going to correspond to particle-like states of definite energy uh, and momentum. So, um, let's see. So, first of all, something to say. Um, so here, A is a, what's often called a transverse field. A, if I have a vector field whose divergence is zero, it's called a transverse field because so plane wave states, so plane waves, if I have a solution that's a plane wave, <coughs> then got x minus omega t, where omega is the magnitude of k. Okay, you can easily check that in order for this to solve the wave equation, omega has to equal the magnitude of k. Um, so this is a solution It's a solution of the wave equation. If we want div a to be zero, so if we want div a to be zero, if you take the divergence of this, it brings out, brings down the k dot. We need k dot a zero to be zero, or indeed k dot a to be zero. So if you have a wave vector in this direction, the vector potential is perpendicular or orthogonal to the to the wave vector. Now, let's see. All right, you know that already. Um, so what else do I need to write down here? What I need to write down here, let me just, we're going to get rid of, remember phi is zero, so let me just write this. So we've got all the equations that we need are here, so E, just minus the ADT, all right, phi is zero. E is minus the ADT, B is the curl of A, and remember that the Hamiltonian, 
So this, we're just doing classical for the moment. There's no operator. The Hamiltonian or the total energy of the electromagnetic field is a half total <coughs> integral of all space of E squared plus B squared, where E is minus A dot and B is the curl of A. This is everything you need to know about the classical electromagnetic field in the Coulomb gauge. All right, the rest of the derivation, don't worry, you, you should have done that sometime before anyway. All right, so now, and I've just told you what a transverse field is, so now let's analyze uh, this wave equation. So, first of all, what we're going to do is there's a trick I have to explain to you. Um, that is used a lot, well, not just in quantum field theory, but um, often in physics. So, in, so A, X, and T is a field on the whole of infinite space. There we go, infinite space. Now, infinite space. Now, <coughs> what you have is um, you have an uncountable or continuous number of so DOF stands for degree of freedom. So degrees of freedom. You've got a continuous. At each point in space, you've got a you've got a vector. At each point in space, there's a vector, and there are continuous, of course, space is continuous, and mathematically, it can be a bit awkward to deal with. So there is a convenient um, there is a convenient trick to make the, the degrees of freedom. Uh, countable or discrete. So what we do is we say, all right, we're going to um, study the field inside a volume, a finite volume. finite volume V. With periodic boundary conditions. So, we imagine, um, I can draw this very well. Imagine we have a box <coughs> Just draw. Um, hang on, let's draw a box. Uh, uh, there we go. So we have a box of side L and volume. Now what we're going to do is, let me get a clear this blackboard. <coughs> um, now sometimes people get, get a bit confused as to what we're doing here. Um, we're, not assume, we're, not, we're not going to assume that the field is periodic. Okay, what we're doing is, I tell you what, let me, um, let me, just, do, let me just do it in one dimension for the moment. Imagine I had uh, a field call it A, imagine I have a field of just one component, some scalar field, and it's a field over the whole of space. It has a completely arbitrary spatial dependence. It's not, it's not periodic, it, it, can be, it can be anything. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, let's study the field in um, over a, a length L, an interval L. We're going to look at the field over an interval L. this interval um, and, and, and later we're going to let L go to infinity anyway. We're going to let L be arbitrarily large. L is arbitrarily large but finite. So we're not really, well, we're not really going to let it go to infinity. We can, we can say it's finite but arbitrarily large. Now for any finite L, what I can do is I can say, all right, I'm just focusing attention on this interval. So what I can do is I don't, I'm not even going to look at the function outside here. All right, I'm just going to look at it in this interval. I'm going to close my eyes and forget about the function outside that interval. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a mathematical extension <coughs> where I make this thing periodic. So here's 2L, and I'm drawing this terribly convincingly, but this is supposed to look exactly like this. And here there's minus L, so like this, um, and so on, minus 2L. In other words, I just take a copy of this function and I just do what's called the periodic extension. Periodic extension. And then, but I'm actually not really caring about what's out here. I'm just formally speaking, I'm going to say, let's, let's look at the periodic extension. And then what I can do is I can write, I can then write A of X as a Fourier series, as a Fourier series. <coughs> now, if I hadn't done this, if I just had the function on the infinite interval, on the whole real line, I, I would have had to write it as a, as a Fourier transform, which involves an integral and a continuous spectrum of frequencies. So even when you do the Fourier transform, you've still got a continuous number of degrees of freedom. Whereas if I do this trick, um, if I write the functions of Fourier series, I now have a discrete degrees of freedom and a countable number of frequencies. Okay. So um, this trick, we do the same in, um, in three dimensions. If I can imagine if I have three dimensional space and I've got a field over the whole of space, and I say, look, I tell you what I'm going to do is let's look at the field inside a box of side L and imagine that the whole of space is covered in these boxes. So here's a um, <coughs> box. You imagine. Um, So it's just a three-dimensional version of what I'm doing here. Okay, imagine I've got, and there's another one of course under here, I've got the whole of space is covered by these neighboring boxes. But what I can say is, look, I'm only interested in the field in here, and I'm going to let L be as large as we want anyway. And what I'll do is the field outside the box, I'm going to replace with the periodic extension of what the field is in here. So I can then write my field as a Fourier series, instead of as, as a Fourier integral, instead of a Fourier transform, because I want to write the field in terms of plane wave states. So if I have the field over infinite space, I would have to write it as a Fourier transform. If I restrict myself to a finite region and define the rest field elsewhere by a periodic extension, I can write a Fourier series. So then it allows me to make the degrees of freedom discrete. So what happens, in order to 
Um, and maybe I'm making it sound more complicated than it is, but to do, to do this, in order to realize this, you need the periodic, the periodic boundary condition, which simply says that A of X plus L is equal to A of X. This is all you need to impose in order to realize this. All right, you say that the field at any point, if I take the field at any point, if I translate by L, I get the same value. So that's all it is. So similarly here, we're going to impose periodic boundary conditions in three-dimensional space. So A, X plus L, Y, Z, T equals A, X, Y, Z, T, and similarly for Y and Z. So Y plus L, Z, T, and A, X, Y, Z plus L, oops, T, <coughs> A, X, Y, Z, T. Now, if we, um, so let me just finish this and then I'll check for questions in case I've uh, not explained it well. Um, if you now look at um, we're going to write, let me write down the Fourier expansion So it's going to look, it looks like this. Um, I'll explain one part at a time. So Fourier expansion have a sum over k, and here we have the index r is 1, 2, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, there's an overall factor to the omega, where omega is the, um, is this, this, what's sometimes called, often called the, for, for historical reasons, I think, that a normalization volume in this context is often called a normalization volume. Um, but now, and there are these little three-dimensional vectors, little three vectors, which never mind these for the moment, I just want to concentrate for a second on the following. Um, that I'm going to write a Fourier transform, a Fourier series written in a form to guarantee that the field is real. Let me come back to that too. Let me just check I've written this down correctly. One over, so this is a square root to the omega. All right, the bit I want to concentrate on is where k, the allowable wave vectors are k is equal to 2 pi over L, n1, n2, n3, where n1, n2, and n3 are integers positive, negative, or zero. So never mind about these factors here for the moment. Just think about the following. At a certain time t, at a fixed time t, I want to do a, make a Fourier expansion of the field as a function of position. Um, and I'm going to do it in terms of complex, instead of sines and cosines, I'll do it in terms of complex <coughs> exponentials. 
terms of complex exponentials. <coughs> now, I'm looking at the field in a volume V with these periodic boundary conditions, which just means, um, you know, you, 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 you've defined a, uh, a periodic extension of the function. I mean, the reason I go on about this is because sometimes people get confused with, um, you may have looked, for instance, at an electromagnetic field in a cavity where I've got, you know, I've got a, a real box with metal walls. And I say, oh, I have to impose boundary conditions at the cavity. I mean, that's a different thing. There you've, there you've got a physical box where the, because there's a, there's a metal at the boundaries, it, it, that imposes boundary conditions on the field. Here, the field is arbitrary. It's an arbitrary field in infinite space. This is a purely mathematical construct. I'm looking at the field in a finite volume, and then I'm saying, let's imagine that I copy the field periodically everywhere else. So then I can write the field in this volume as a Fourier series. Okay, it is different from the physical box. That's why I've gone on about this name, maybe it's too much. But anyway, the periodic boundary conditions um, uh, <coughs> needs to be satisfied. It means that while my complex exponentials, the k's, can't be arbitrary, the k's have to be in the components, have to be integer multiples of 2 pi over L in order for each of these um, uh, complex uh, exponentials to be periodic. Okay? So that, sh that should be clear, that the wave vectors um, are restricted uh, to be of this form. Now, why have I got tutor? Why am I not just writing it like this? This would be a more conventional Fourier series, just with summing over some coefficient. Remember, at some fixed time t, these will be some coefficients. I can, you could write it like this. It's just that then, remember, we want our field A to be real. For A to be real, you then have to impose a condition on A, that A star k would have to be equal A of minus k. Things get a bit awkward. So it's easier to just write it down like this in the first place where if you take the complex conjugate of this expression, this turns into this, and this turns into <coughs> that, and you guarantee that the field is real. So it's convenient to write it like this. Okay, it's a bit of a slightly unusual way of writing a Fourier series with the same thing. What's this factor in front? This factor in front here is just for convenience. Later we'll find that with the physical interpretation, it's good to just put some overall factor in front. It doesn't, doesn't make any difference to talk about it. But then there's this here. Okay, these are the epsilon KR um, are three dimensional unit vectors. <coughs> now, of course, A, we're, we're looking at a vector field. We're expanding, and you could think of this one component at a time. Then each component is like expanding a scalar field. But if you've got three components, well, I have to have um, a vector here in front. Now, these um, vectors satisfy the following. They are um, there are two of these vectors. R is what for each k. There are two vectors, r is 1 and 2, and they satisfy the following conditions. That epsilon kr, the dot product with epsilon ks, is delta rs. What does that mean? It just means that these are um, orthogonal. Um, so epsilon k1 on K2 are orthogonal. Are orthogonal and epsilon KR dotted with K is equal to zero. So they are orthogonal to K. So have, just draw a little picture. <coughs> so for each k, for each k, so if 
this is k, I have epsilon k1, whoops, and epsilon k2. So epsilon k1 and epsilon k2, they're mutually perpendicular, okay, they're orthogonal to each other, and they are unit vectors. They're unit vectors and they are orthogonal to k. Okay, so we have these conditions here. So here I should have said r and s and equal 1 or 2. So just as a way of summarizing, if r is equal to s, then it's just the dot product of the vector with itself is 1, it's a unit vector. If r is not equal to s, then this is 0, they're orthogonal. Um, for any r, the dot product of epsilon kr with k is zero, so they're orthogonal to k. So what the what the the, the, the upshot of all of this really you, is that the, the functions the functions epsilon kr e to the i k dot x. Um, and All right. the functions, these functions form complete set with which you can expand any transverse vector field. So um, the condition Why are these epsilon, why are these unit vectors orthogonal to K? Well, these guarantee that the divergence of A is zero. If you look at this expansion, if you take its divergence, then in each of these terms it will bring down the K dot. And when I have a K dot, epsilon KR, I'll get zero. And so, in fact, each, each of these terms will vanish when I take the divergence. So if you look at this, you know, you're building up, if you imagine, you know, first of all, imagine this was just a scalar field you're expanding at some time t in this, in this finite volume. Well, then, you know, you would do something like this. You would sum over these complex exponentials. If you want to guarantee that the field is real, what well, is more convenient to write it like this? And of course, because of the periodic boundary conditions, the k's are restricted to these values. Okay. Because you've got a vector field, well, you're going to need you're going to need a vector in front of each term here. Now, you've, because we have a transverse vector field whose divergence is zero, a well, simple way to guarantee that is to is to have the, each of these vectors orthogonal to k. Okay, when each of these vectors are orthogonal to k. And then finally, um, because um, you know you've got uh, the, the vector degrees of freedom that are left over, well, I can ju I just need two for each value of k. I just need two unit vectors, okay, that the, are the sufficient to to be able to write down the components of any vector. So um, anyway, you might want to think that through. But basically, all we're doing here is we're saying if I want to do a Fourier series for an arbitrary vector field that is transverse in a finite volume with periodic boundary conditions, then this is the general expression. And this factor here is put in um, uh, just for later convenience. Um, so let's see.
there any questions about that? Any questions about that? Maybe I'll lay with it a bit. So if you want the A, uh, Fourier expansion of A to be <coughs> why don't you simply take courses in science and take those courses? Oh, you, you could do that. You could do, you could do that. So what happens? It turns out that when you when you write, um, if you writing it like this, these quantities, when they become operators, are going to behave like annihilation and creation operators for for, for the for the for the energy levels. Um, if you had sines and cosines. Um, your coefficients would be superpositions of a's and a daggers, and it would just it would just be it's simpler. Basically, the particle the, the interpretation in terms of energy levels is more straightforward in terms of a and a and, and in terms of a as defined like this. So that that's the only thing. sort of knowing what's coming. That's that's the only reason that you could you could do that. Okay, so let me move on and. Um, Actually, there's something else I want to say about this. Um, all right, there's something else I want to say about this. Um, so we've noticed that we've now made the, um, we now have a discrete, discrete degrees of freedom. With the field now, we've got the time evolving field. Um, in the the function, this function can now be replaced by instead of a x t, we have a k r t, where k is equal to two pi over l n one n two n three and r is 1, 2, and the ends here are integers. So I have an infinite number, but a discrete number of degrees of freedom. So, um, and here, you know, this is a discrete sum over k and r. The sum over k, it really means a sum over these integers, n1, n2, n3. Now, um, something that's worth a few properties, properties to note properties to note. So, something to check. Here's the first little bit of homework. Um, is the following. Let us, let us take um, e to the i k minus k prime dot x. So here k prime just, of course, another allowed wave vector. I've got a different set of integers. I've got another allowed wave vector. Let's integrate it, not over all space, but over the volume V. Let's integrate it over the volume V, and let's divide it by V. The answer is the Kronecker delta, k, k prime. In other words, this is equal to 1 if k is k prime. In other words, if all three of these integers are the same, and it will be equal to 0 if k is not equal to k prime. So, you know, so one thing about homework here is I don't um, is I don't ask you to hand in homeworks because you're adults. You, you can do your homework. If you have any problems with your homework, you can, you, you can ask me. So you can ask me after class. You can also email me or anytime ask me to arrange an office hour. I'm available anytime for an office hour. I don't do a regular weekly office hour because I sit there in my office and no one ever turns up. So, but if anyone wants you, please just email me. We can set a time, make an appointment, preferably late afternoon. We can go through. So the homeworks, some of the homeworks I'm going to give you are just to fill in little gaps in derivations. 
some of the homeworks are going to be problems that are similar to the kind of thing that will come up on the exam. Okay, so, so please do the homework. Now you might just want to check this. So basically what happens is if you think, if you think about this, um, each of these complex exponentials, you can write it as a sine and a cosine. And what you're doing here Remember the periodic boundary because of the periodic because of the periodicity. Each of these functions, we've chosen the case to be such that the function is periodic with period L in each spatial dimension. So what happens when you do this integral for each x, y, and z? The sines and cosines are being integrated over a whole number of periods. If I take the sine function and I integrate it over one period, I get zero a cosine over a whole number of periods, you always get zero. And of course, if k is equal to k prime, I mean, I'm just doing it for you, but anyway, if k is equal to k prime, <coughs> this is one, and this integral is just v. Divide by v, I get one, obviously. If k is not equal to k prime, you'll find you're integrating with oscillatory sines and cosines over a whole numbers of periods, so you always get zero. There you go, I've already done it for you. Anyway, all right, so now, but then there's something um, interesting and, and useful to note is that well now let v uh, let v go to infinity let v be arbitrarily large you know that one over two pi q times the integral over all space. All right. What am I doing? What am I doing? Um, into the i. What did I do? K minus k prime. So k minus k prime dot x. So sometimes I put the integral element before, sometimes after. Anyway, it depends on my mood. Anyway. Um, let us just look at this integral. I'm integrating over all space of this exponential, 1 over 2 pi cube. What is that? You should know that this is the three-dimensional uh, Dirac delta function. Okay, if k is equal to k prime, this is infinite. If k is not equal to k prime, this is zero. This is the three-dimensional Dirac delta function. I assume you've met this before. If we now look at our expression here. Um, so what does this imply? It tells us that, well, um, two, we could write it like this, two pi q two pi q times the Dirac delta function is equal to this integral, which is equal to v times delta k, k prime. This is a very useful, um, if I'm considering the limit of infinitely large volume, then in effect there's a correspondence here, which is true of course only in the limit, that the, so if k is equal to k prime, then this is one, but v is going to infinity. So here you have the infinity of the delta function. If k is not equal to k prime, both sides are zero. So there's a correspondence, but really a more precise way of putting it would be that as v goes to infinity, there's a correspondence between v times the Kronecker delta and 2 pi q times the three-dimensional Dirac delta function. They become, they become equal or can be considered equal in the limit. And it's going to be very useful um, in, in what follows. Um, so, because what we're going to do is sometimes it's very convenient to write down the equations with these discrete number of degrees of freedom. We've got these sums rather than integrals. What often happens when you come to do a calculation is that at the end you're going to let V go to infinity and the sums are going to become integrals, okay? So, you know, that is a typical, um, typical 
uh, scenario that we write down the theory with finite V, finite volume, because everything's discrete and easy to handle. But then at the end, when you finish the calculation, you let V go to infinity. So there's one last little property, um, a very useful, very useful formula, which we'll be using. Uh, we'll be using a lot is that again, um, <coughs> again valid in the limit where v, v is arbitrarily large, and that is the following, that 1 over v times the sum of k corresponds, you've probably met this before, but just in case you haven't, 1 over 2 pi cubed times the integral of d3k. Now, um, just in case maybe you've seen this before and someone didn't explain it to you properly, let's make sure we've got this. So here is, we're looking at k space, okay? And remember that k, the allowed values of k are 2 pi over L times a triplet of integers. So if you think about it, what that means, it means I've got a lattice here. I've got a lattice, a three-dimensional lattice of allowed values, and I'm drawing it terribly. But anyway, there's a three-dimensional lattice of k values um, separated by distances L. Now, if you imagine, look at the following sum. Imagine I had some um, some function of k, and let us multiply by 2 pi over l, 2 pi, sorry, what am I saying? Someone should, should correct me. The distance, the separation between the point is not l, it's 2 pi over l, okay? 2 pi over l. Maybe someone transmitted it to me with their, with their brain wave. Anyway, 2 pi over L, okay, is, is the spacing between the, the lattice points. Now imagine I consider the following sum. I say let us sum over all values of K. We're going to take a function, we're going to sum over K and multiply by, by these things in front. What is this? Remember, I'm going to take, we're taking L goes to infinity v goes to infinity, remember v is L cubed. So this spacing is becoming arbitrarily small. So um, what is this? This is just a sum over k of, I can think of this as a small element, this the delta, delta kx, delta ky, delta kz, Okay, these flat, this is just the distance between, between these points, so I can think of it as a little element in K space. And of course, as L goes to infinity, the spacing goes to zero, this just becomes the integral uh, over K of the function. All right, so you can see here that, um, so in other words, what does this mean? It means 2 pi cubed. 2 pi cubed divided by L cubed, or V. 2 pi cubed over V times the sum over K is equal to an integral over K for V going to infinity. So this is the trick that we're going to use I, I, I always remember it this way, and you remember it however you prefer, that 1 over v times the sum over k is equivalent to 1 over 2 pi cubed times the integral over k in the limit of large volume. It's going to be very useful because, as I said, we write down the theory with sums, but usually when you come to do a calculation at the end, you, you let v go to infinity and the sums become integrals, and we work out, it, because integrals tend to be easier to work out than sums anyway, um, so, all right, so that's just a bit of the um, straightening out the, um, the 
the mathematics. There's a lot of sort of little, little bit tedious stuff, basically. So let's not um, you know, lose sight of the, the big picture. What are we doing here so far? What have we got? We're looking at a free electromagnetic field. Free electromagnetic field in the Coulomb gauge. And it satisfies the wave equation. And the Coulomb gauge constraint. Remember that this was the entire content of Maxwell's equations for the free electromagnetic field. What we've done is we've now, in effect, we replaced all the information in these equations is now contained in this expansion. Okay, we've now we've now said, all right, we're going to we're going to solve these equations, but we're going to look at a finite volume V, and after let V be arbitrarily large, so we can write the solution to the wave equation um, in this form. Ah, hang on, sorry, I still have to impose, sorry. So far I've done a Fourier expansion with the periodic boundary conditions. And what I've imposed is the, um, the Coulomb gauge constraint, which tells us that K dot epsilon KR, these are orthogonal to the wave vector. So the information, so sorry, I, 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 I misspoke. The information in this part has already been used. We still have to write down, remember these are arbitrary time dependent coefficients, so we still have to impose the, the wave equation. So here we're going to come to the next homework problem is if you substitute Use the wave equation to show the following. These, co these time dependent coefficients satisfy the following equation. So AKR T, two dots. So two dots means a second time derivative of each of these coefficients is equal to minus omega squared times the coefficient. Okay, so you simply take this expansion, plug it into the wave equation, and you're probably going to want to use the orthogonality of these functions. this statement which I wrote down before, this says that well these functions, these complex exponentials are orthogonal functions uh, on, on this volume. Um, so what you could do is you could take, the, if you take this expansion and plug it into the wave equation and then multiply by e to the minus i k prime dot x and integrate over all space you should find that all the terms vanish except one. Okay, so you can pick out one term. And with a little bit of fiddling around, you should be able to show this. Okay. Um, so basically, you are, you know, here you've got an infinite number of terms that you plug in here. In order to project out one term, you multiply <coughs> by this and integrate over all the space. And because of the Kronecker delta, when you do the sum, all the terms will vanish except one that you'll pick out. Anyway, you should be able to show that. So, we now have exhausted all of the information in Maxwell's equations. If here we have the complete theory of a free electromagnetic field in a finite volume where k is restricted to the, to the integer values of the components. Uh, times 2 pi over L. The epsilons here are orthogonal to the wave vector, so div A is always zero. These time-dependent coefficients satisfy this equation, 
so the whole vector field satisfies the wave equation. So we can now forget about Maxwell's equation. We've exhausted the information or everything you need to know about the free electromagnetic field is in these <coughs> equations with these conditions. So now finally, there's just one last uh, item that we need to uh, take into account, and that is, ah, okay, hang on, let me just write, write down, of course, the solution to the A, which the solution is taken in the following form. We're going to take A, K, R, of T to equal so AKR with no argument, that means I AKR at zero times E to the minus I omega T. We're going to write the solution in this form because it will turn out that these quantities like this, uh, or you know, you could use sines and cosines, you could use e to the i, e to the minus i, or combinations, but solutions in this form, these quantities will correspond to the raising and lowering operators for the energy level. So this is just again looking ahead at what's coming, um, here we have the solution. Okay, so now there's one more thing, one more thing is the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian. H is the Hamiltonian of the electromagnetic field, which is a half times the integral over all space of E squared plus B squared. And remember, E is minus the ADT, and B is the curl of A. Now, here is where I come to assign the first serious homework problem, which is the kind of thing that will come up in the exam. So, homework. Homework. And this is important. Is what you need to do is, remember we have an expression here for A, in terms of the little a's. So we can write the electric field and the magnetic field also as a series involving the little a's. And we can substitute in here, we can square these expressions, substitute in, integrate over all space. And you should show, and you need to show that this comes out to be the following sum, omega, AKR star AKR. Show this. This is your homework problem to show. Now it is, you know, there's some pain involved here, and there's going to be a lot of pain coming in this course. So the sooner you get used to it, the better. Um, this kind of problem, um, if you can't do, if you can't work this out, now I'm not saying you'll be able to work it out immediately and you've only done this kind of thing before, but this kind of problem, if you can't do this kind of thing, then my estimated probability of you passing the exam is equal to zero. Okay. Right, so work this out. Now, just to give you a little hint, you know, just to get you started, let's say look at the, look at the term involving uh, the electric field. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is write down an expression for the electric field. So I need to take the time derivative of this. So what's it going to look like? I've got epsilon kr. Um, and sorry, I should have written in, remember we've got these. Um, let me write it in. Let me write it as it is. So we're taking the solution here. Um, 
that form. So I have um, e a dot x minus omega t plus a star k. I should have written this down earlier. Anyway, e to the minus i. So we had we had the expansion with coefficient the expansion at a given time t. We were expanding as a function of x, and the coefficients were some unknown functions of time. We then imposed the wave equation, the coefficients as functions of time become this here. So substituting in our series, our expansion for uh, the vector potential uh, looks like this. Where these are constants, the AKR, the AKR star, they are constants. So I have the plane wave form. So this is now the plane wave form that we met before. OK, going back to, I want to calculate the electric field and take the time derivative. So the time derivative here will just bring down a minus i omega. A k r e to the i and k bar x minus omega t. Here I'm going to have a plus i omega a star k r to the minus i k dot x minus omega t. And now I have to look at e squared. So e squared. So e squared. So what you want to do, e squared is e dot e. e dot e. What you want to do is write one e as a sum over k, and the other e in the same way, but maybe with a k prime and an r prime. So e dot e is going to be a sum. It's going to be a double sum over kr and k prime r prime. I'm going to have a 1 over root 2v omega, a 1 over root 2v omega prime. There's going to be an epsilon kr dotted with epsilon k prime r prime. And then I'm going to have Imagine this term multiplying the same term but with k and omega replaced by k prime and omega prime. So I'm going to have terms like minus i squared, that becomes a, a minus, there will be an omega, omega prime, there will be an a k r, an a k prime r prime, there will be um, e to the i k dot x minus omega t, e to the i, k prime dot x minus omega prime t, plus a whole lot of plus um, three other sets of terms. Okay. Now it's looking like a horrendous mess, and you're thinking, I want to quit this course. So now what you do is you get each of these terms, you're going to integrate over all space. Now, when you integrate over all space, what's going to save you is um, the fact that 1 over v e to the i k minus k prime dot x is just the connector delta. Okay, I have all of these terms. So here you see there's an e to the i k dot x and there's an e to the i k prime dot x. When you integrate over all space, you're going to get a delta k minus k prime from this term. Okay, this term is going to be zero except when k equals minus k prime and so on. So basically each of the terms in here when you square this out, when you integrate over all space, you will always, from this integration here, you will get Kronecker deltas such that the double sum will collapse to a single sum. Okay, it will collapse to a single sum. And you can see that here, um, you know, it's going to turn out that, well, the, the omega and omega primes are equal. You're going to get these terms, it's just going to become a 1 over 2 the omega. And with some fiddling around, <coughs> you should be able to derive this expression. But in the end, it collapses to a single sum. And all of these phase terms 
everything cancels out and you just get uh, this expression here. So please try to show that. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of an involved calculation, but it's the sort of thing that we're going to be doing all the time uh, in this course. And in fact, later on it's going to be worse because we're going to have to do this for operator fields. You're going to have to do something like this. So those of you who are still not too late to quit the course, we're going to have to do calculations like this, but where these are all operators. The A's are operators, all operators. And then the computation relations taken into account is a bit like this, but worse. Oh, terrible. OK, so um, Thursday we're going to carry on. We're going to quantize this system. We're almost there. This is starting to look like the sum of the Hamiltonian for a sum of oscillators. Um, please do that homework problem. And uh, if it's painful, that's good. It means that you're growing and you're stretching yourself. So if there are any questions, I'm here. And please, um, office hour, anytime I'm available, anyone you could just email me. Um, are, are there any questions? Okay, so you know, remember the big picture here, that really we found just a convenient way of writing out, it may not look very convenient at the end, but for quantum field theory, it's a convenient way of writing. I've just got a free electromagnetic field. It's a sum over plane waves, which we've discussed with some coefficients. It's confined to an arbitrarily large but finite volume, so it's a discrete system. I've got these vectors in front of the vector field. These vectors, each one is orthogonal to k, so that means I need a Coulomb gauge. Um, the k's are constrained to take those integer values, and, and, and that's all it is. It's not, you know, the, 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 so the first time to, to construct all this formalism is a bit of a nuisance. But once it's done, now it's, you know, things become uh, very easy. The, the, the contact with the picture of particles as excitation. Um, is then immediate in terms of these A's and A stars are going to become raising and lowering operators in the quantum theory, and the, the particle interpretation is then very easy. So that, that's you know that's the reason of course why we're doing all we're, why we're doing all this. All right, so see you on Thursday.